Once all the Animorphs had been acquainted with Dancer, it was time to make a plan. Dancer told them, to tell you the truth, Santa has been unusually quiet, which is strange for him, especially this close to Christmas. Ordinarily at this time, we'd be reviewing flight plans daily, checking the forecast, and checking it twice. But as I told you, we reindeer tend to mind our own business out here on the ranch, except for Christmas Eve. We let the design and fabrication crews do their work. We come in for one extraordinary night of distribution. And then our payment is the freedom to live out here the rest of the year. I can take you in toward the edge of the village, but it would honestly draw attention if I wandered into town. Not to mention how much attention four human children and a hawk will draw. You'll have to morph. I don't know how inconspicuous any of our morphs will be here either, Dancer, said Cassie, back in human form, or how many could stand this cold. We'll keep our eyes open on the walk, Cassandra, said Dancer. The Christmas tree forest is full of seasonal animals that wouldn't look out of place at all in the village. Dancer led the Animorphs away from the stable where they'd spent the night and onto a narrow path into a deep, coniferous forest. The evergreen trees were tall and straight, all growing as perfect pyramid shapes. Some of the trees here were as tall as, well, as tall as really tall trees. A dusting of snow weighted every branch, and the further into the woods they went, the shorter the trees became. Small, shiny objects started to appear, at first small and oblong, and then larger circles and stars and ornaments and tinsel, Marco shouted. What is this? I told you that this is the Christmas tree forest, Marco, answered Dancer. Who does all this decorating? asked Marco. Dancer responded, oh, of course. All of the ornaments and tinsel in the world is grown from these trees, Marco. They grow in the Christmas tree forest like fruit on your trees. Marco's eyes grew even bigger. All around, as far as they could see, were thousands of Christmas trees, each covered with ornaments and tinsel that sparkled in the light. What's that? Marco shouted. Birds! Everywhere! Birds! The other Animorphs followed where his finger was pointing. Sure enough, hundreds of birds were circling Christmas trees, each dangling long, rope-like objects behind them. Is that garland? he added. Yes, Marco. Good eyes. The birds string garland on the new Christmas trees all year long, and I bet some of those birds would also be perfect morphs for you, Dancer said. As they began walking toward where the birds were at, there was a barely perceptible movement right in front of them, and everyone, including Dancer, jumped, slightly startled. Something had definitely just moved in front of them. But looking around, there was just the same snow, and birds, and Christmas trees, and a snowman, Jake announced, looking visibly relieved. Something on Dancer's face was less assured. Wait, Jacob. A snow person, yes, but you should never approach them too fast, Dancer cautioned. Turning to address the snow person, Dancer said, Season's greeting, friend. Please, do not let our little excursion disturb your labor. As if in slow motion, the snow person's head turned to face Dancer. They had two coal eyes and a carrot nose, a scarf, a top hat, and branch arms. A low rumbling noise like boots crushing fresh snow emitted from somewhere deep inside the snow person, and they made what looked like a slight bow toward Dancer before slowly shuffling away. What, what just happened? asked Jake, visibly off-put now. I thought snowmen, and sorry, snow people, we're all jolly and thumpity thump thump over the fields of snow. That was like, like, like a monster. Jake, Rachel yelled at him. Come on, you don't know anything. They probably think you're a monster. The dancer stopped them. 
Jacob, Rachel. They're not monsters, and neither are you. The snow people keep to themselves. They don't bother speaking to anyone else much because it comes at a great physical cost to them to form words outside of their own language. But they mostly live out even further beyond the reindeer ranch, so seeing one here is highly unusual. They must have a reason. Something out of the ordinary is going on. Okay, I guess they aren't monsters, but why are they like that? Jake kept at it. They're just like the way they are, Jacob, answered Dancer. The elves, however, do continue to think lesser of the snow people. And really, it's a bad look on the elves. But the snow people were animated by magic. They would not have had sentience on their own. The elves regard this as an aberration, a misuse of magic. And they have their own reasons for that. But the snow people are no threat to anyone if not provoked, and are largely isolated from everyone else in the North Pole. All the same, I wouldn't want to run into one of them on a dark night, Jake said belligerently. Grow up, Jake, said Cassie. They're just different than you. Besides, you're a kid who turns into animals. Coming from Cassie, that hurt. But Jake didn't have time to dwell on it because they walked right into the middle of a cacophony of birds, singing and flying, strands of garland trailing behind them in the air, circling around Christmas trees. From above, Tobias was circling with them, swooping down toward his friends. Wow, you guys! There's so many kinds of birds I've never even seen before, Tobias said. Like that one with the popcorn garland. What kind of bird is that, Dancer? Uh, let me see, that's a, uh, uh, well that looks to be a turtle dove, Tobias. Although I'm not a bird expert exactly, Dancer said. What morph should we get, you guys? Asked Marco, already rushing toward a strand, stand of Christmas trees decked out in orange and red ornaments. I would suggest, Marco, said Dancer, something inconspicuous, something common. Oh boy, said Rachel. Will they let us touch them, Dancer? Yes, Rachel. Almost all of the animals in the North Pole are very docile and friendly creatures. Conveniently, you shouldn't have any trouble acquiring any one that you see, Dancer answered. Wow, so many animals to acquire, Rachel said. This is like a very Animorphs Christmas. And with that, the Animorphs were off among the endless rows of Christmas trees adorned with ripe ornaments, garlands swirling overhead, and flocks of birds singing all around. <laughs> An hour later, no one would have looked twice at four calling birds in a park room sitting on a windowsill outside of an elf toy factory. Only, if they'd looked so much closer and heard the park room speaking, would they have noticed something was slightly off. I still don't like it, Tobias complained. I look like a clown. Shh, Tobias. It was the only way, and besides, Rachel giggled, you look fabulous. Rachel and Cassie were both giggling now. It was true. Tobias did look great. They had decided that a red-tailed hawk would be conspicuous at the North Pole, but since Tobias couldn't morph into a partridge, they decorated him instead. Lots of glitter, ribbons, and garland. And even a few convincing hair ornaments later, Tobias was a glamorous Christmas partridge. Will you knock it off, Jake said. Ever since the girls had given Tobias this makeover, Jake couldn't stop noticing how much attention they were giving Tobias all of a sudden. Especially since Cassie had also told him to grow up earlier. We're supposed to be spying, he continued. Okay, Jake, sure, Cassie replied. We're just saying how good Tobias looks in this morph. It's not even a real morph, Tobias sulked. It's not the same as a morph, but it's a transformation all the same, Rachel said. And who knows? Maybe that'll come in useful again. Guys, check this out, Marco said. For once, Marco was paying more attention to the task at hand than anyone else. In fact, ever since they had gotten to the North Pole, Marco had been more attentive and seemed completely engrossed in everything that was going on around him. The others turned to look through the window too. What they saw inside was every kid's dream. 
what seemed like an endless amount of toys being made, presents being wrapped, and everywhere elves on sewing machines in a spray booth with a wielding gear, with welding gear, unloading kilns, stacking presents with a forklift, rolling out cookie dough, clocking in at a time clock. Throughout the factory, there were roaring fireplaces, which some elves kept stoked while others were on a break, and eggnog coolers with bulletin boards where other elves congregated, and elsewhere, decorations, tinsel, and garland hung on every wall. Ornaments dangled from the ceilings over every workspace, high enough for the elves to say safe clearance underneath. And at the center of it, the most remarkable decoration of all, the single largest Christmas tree. As big as a very big tree, trimmed in ornaments and spun and sparkled strings of lights and flashed choreographed light show. The garland looked exactly like real icicles, an all-glass floor catching the light at the base and on top of it, all the most magnificent, glowing, vibrant tree topper emanating in its own light out over the whole factory. So radiant, it even cast light out the windows and slightly melted the snow where it hit. Wow! This is better than the ski lodge anyway, Marco said, transfixed. Don't forget why we're here, Marco, Jake said. First Rachel, Cassie, and now Marco. Jake was not having a great day. Sorry, Jake, said Marco. I know the lodge means a lot to you, but this is Santa's workshop. Before Jake had a chance to respond, he too was moved to the window. Is that, Jake said. It can't be, Cassie whispered. Through the window, they looked at exactly the same spot, just emerging at the top of the staircase, and then walking on the factory floor was an unmistakable figure. I don't fucking believe this, Rachel said. But there was no question in any of their minds. This was Santa Claus. We've got to get a closer look, Marco said, as he lifted his wings and flew around the side of the factory, above where Santa had just appeared. He settled onto the sill of a window with an intricate glazing pattern like a huge snowflake. As the other animals flew to join him, from where, from here, they had a clear view of Santa, as well as a group of elves that were keeping particularly close to him. What's the update, glass lull? Santa said to the nearest elf. Um, well, Santa, the elf, said the elf, Gaspo, progress has accelerated since we were able to get the decorations complete. Excellent, said Santa. And so you are aware the extra help I requested for the final push before Christmas just arrived last night? They should provide a lot of extra help and motivation to you elves. And you will help, and will help you share this load, Santa continued walking on the factory floor towards the many fireplaces. How many trees are we burning to keep these fires going, he bellowed. And how many elves does it take off the floor to haul this wood and stoke this fire all day? Santa looked around. When the elves offered an answer, he continued his voice rising. Elves! Well, that could be more productive on the floor instead of wasting their time on this resource. What an extravagance. Gassel instructed the five elves to reduce their stroking to once a day. This is a final push, and, it, and if any of them have a problem with that, I'll be glad to meet them individually down in my office. Uh, yes, yes, of course, Santa. It's just, it's just we've always kept these fires blazing, especially in the final week of Christmas. It keeps spirit spray, you know, Gassel said. Gessel, you told me as much, Santa replied, leaning down to look at Gessel's eyes. You told me as much about the cookie buffet, the eggnog coolers as well. I'm tired of arguing with you, Gessel, which is why I'm prompting, promoting Lindor as shop supervisor effective immediately. At that, another elf who had been keeping close behind Santa stepped forward. This is, this is, y you can't, it's just... I've had this position for so many Christmases, I love this shop, Gassel said, eyes to the ground. And I love this shop too, Gassel, replied Lednor. And there will always be a place for you if you're willing to share. Tis the season, after all. We're done here, Santa said. Gassel, punch your card on the way out, and maybe reconsider what Lednor offered. I'll be down in my office. There's some work I must complete before Christmas Eve. 
Lenore, I want those fire elves off the clock now and relocated to production. Seize their axes so they, can, so they can't chop any additional wood tonight and remind them they're all invited to share in the work at any time. At that, Santa turned back towards the staircase where he'd entered before disappearing out of sight. Still surrounded by a couple dozen elves, a few who remained positioned at the top of the stairs. The animals watched as Lednor headed towards the fire elves, who were enthusiastically stroking the, the fireplace. What the fuck was that, Rachel asked. Why the fuck wouldn't Santa want fucking fires and cookies? Jake responded, I'm not sure if he has a reason, Rachel. I mean, 20 minutes ago, I didn't even think Santa was real. And now that we've seen him, you're questioning how he operates? Rachel's right, Jake. That was fucking weird, said Cassie. I gotta agree with Jake. That was Tobias. And what did he mean by extra help? You don't think he stopped there. Jake did think exactly what Tobias was about to say, and so did everyone else. When Santa had that extra help, had arrived last night, they all thought about Tom and the sharing. But what did it mean? It wasn't like Tom knew anything about making toys or helping elves. The others noticed that Marco was unusually quiet, still intensely focused on the factory floor. What's up, Marco? asked Tobias. It's these fire elves, Marco said, staring through the window. They threw their time cards into the fire, and now they've all linked arms and are marching together towards the door. As Marco described the scene, the others looked in, and sure enough, at least 50 fire elves had linked arms and elbows in a group of 12, of a group of 10 or 12, and were walking past their huge Christmas tree towards the two large arched wooden doors at the far end of the factory. And then, to the Animorphs' disbeliefs, other elves started forming a mass on both sides of the fire elves, shouting at them. And these other elves looked mad. They were already shouting when, from somewhere in the mob, a toy block was thrown at the fire elves, then another, then anything. Pieces of cookies, ornaments, a handful of rivets, a roll of scotch tape. But the fire elves were undeterred. Their chain were unbroken. Their gazes fixed on only the exit, and they continued to march. The mob of angry elves grew, even as some remained at their workstation, but the fire elves took all the abuse that was hurled at them. Finally, they made it to the doors, walked through the threshold, I just don't get it, Marcus said. They were back on the other side of the Christmas tree forest with Dancer again. Why would all these other elves turn on the fire elves? Don't they want to have their fireplaces blazing too? Some even had chestnuts roasting. The fire elves were just doing their job. They didn't have a choice, Marco, said Jake. You heard Santa. He wanted them relocated to work production. But that's not their job, Jake, replied Rachel, working it over in her head. They shouldn't be forced to do work that they're not obligated to do. And if someone tries to make them, even Santa, they should be able to stand up to them. Troubling, troubling, said Dancer. This isn't like Santa at all. What I would like to know, though, is what's down that staircase you mentioned. Though I haven't spent much time in the factory, I'm certain there is a, never a lower level. That's where we've got to get into, Cassie said. It sounds like that's where Santa is spending a lot of his time. He certainly hasn't been spending it out here with the reindeer, Dancer replied. He lowered his voice. While you were in the village this morning, I got in touch with Mrs. Claus. It's a gross breach of etiquette for a reindeer, but I didn't see any other way. Dancer looked all around him as if anyone could be spying, and lowered his voice even more so that the Animorphs had to lean in to hear him. Mrs. Claus said Santa hasn't been home in over a week. All the Animorphs gasped, and Dancer continued. Last she saw him, it was in the middle of the night, and he was sneaking around their own chimney. When she asked him what he was doing, he froze and said to her, "'Tis the season,' and then vanished up the chimney, and he hasn't been back home since. Now this news from you all, and Christmas Eve tomorrow, 
I'd say we have to act and fast. Marco broke the silence. Jake, do you remember? Jake just nodded, thinking the same thing. He paused before speaking, just as quietly as Dancer had. The last night in the cabins, after we overheard Tom talking on the phone, he came back into the den looking like a zombie. He said the same thing to us. Tis the season. What does it mean, Dancer? Dancer shook his head, indicating he was clueless about this to the rest of them. Cassie said, You guys, that basement, we've got to get in and see Santa is doing down there. You're right, Cassie. And Jake, he was glad they were on the same page again. And we need to get going now. We can use some of our bird morphs again. I saw several birds still stringing garland inside the factory anyway. I'll fly the factory with you, but I'm not sure I want to blow my cover inside with my disguise, Tobias said. He kept the partridge look after all the compliments from Rachel and Cassie. Okay, let's get moving, Marco said. Wait a minute, that was Rachel not moving. What about those fire elves? They got fucked today, and are we just gonna forget about them? Rachel, I just don't know that we have time, Jake said. It's already getting dark out. Dancer interjected. I believe that you're right, Rachel. Although finding Santa should be our primary concern, I wonder if the fire elves may prove to have some additional insight into what's going on in the factory. If I had to guess, I'd say the Fire Elf Union Hall is the place we should start. If today was as bad as you described, I'd imagine it is very lively there tonight. Perhaps we could explore there while you go to the factory. Right, yes, I'm going, Rachel said in a way that everyone knew not to argue with. If that's the case, I'll fly along there and keep an eye out, Tobias said. You're not my fucking chaperone, Rachel clapped to back. Tobias looked as hurt as a disguised hawk could. No, but all the same, Rachel, said Dancer. It couldn't hurt to have another set of eyes. The fire elves can be, well, a little hot-headed sometimes. She'll fit right in, mumbled Tobias. Guys, we gotta work together right now, Cassie said. Remember, we all want to stop the Yurks here. Me, Jake, and Marco will go spy on Santa. Rachel and Tobias will check out the fire elves. She turned to Rachel and put her hands on her arms. I can't wait to hear what you find out. They all headed back to the Christmas tree forest before splitting up to go their separate missions. Chapter 7 The toy factory was mostly empty and dark now, except for the lights from the decorations and all over the massive Christmas tree. From where they'd settled on top of a silver pinecone-shaped ornament hanging from the ceiling, Cassie, Jake, and Marco had a clear view of the staircase heading downstairs. Every so often, they could hear fragments of songs from other birds roosting around the building. The three French hen morphs they'd chosen blended in perfectly. Okay, there's just a handful of elves near the stairs, and they don't seem to be paying a lot of attention, Marco whispered. He was right. Five or six elves, who had previously been positioned at the top of the stairs, were now reclining in chairs around the nearest eggnog cooler. The animorphs could hear the elves' conversation. That Santa is a tough one, huh? One of the elves said. What are we up to? An hour at a time? Tops? Another elf replied, Yeah, maybe fifteen. An hour fifteen? But no one can last longer than that yet, and we've been at it for over a week. This elf looked around. I just hope Visser Claus knows what he's doing. The first elf snapped back. Of course Visser Claus knows what he's doing. I should report you for even suggesting he might not. Okay, okay, the second elf replied defensively. Of course he knows what he's doing. It's just that we were supposed to get in here, get the necessary host, and be done before Christmas. Now he's bringing in reinforcements from who knows where, right before Christmas Eve? This has to be done, or we've completely missed the opportunity that only comes but once a year. 
The elf went back to sipping a mug of eggnog. The first elf was visibly agitated and stood up to pace around in a small circle. Did you hear that? Marco whispered again. More talk about bringing in reinforcements for the final push. That's got to be the sharing, Cassie replied. And what about Visser Claus? Do you think that's, you know, Visser Three? That name can't be a coincidence. From another ornament in the factory, several birds spontaneously, spontaneously broke out into Carol of the Bells. Below, the small group of elves were filling their mugs up with more eggnog. A different elf from before had an arm around yet another elf and was saying, You know, these elves are the littlest hosts we've ever had. They're good for me. I like the elves. Those two elves sat down near a fireplace, mugs of eggnog almost spilling as they barely kept a grasp on them. What's up with those elves? Jake asked. I don't know, but I'd say we'd better get going. Only so much time before we have to morph, Cassie replied. All right, Marco said. I'm going to sing a Christmas song too and fly down there. You guys follow my lead. With that, Marco lifted his wings, circled the ornament twice, and began a French hen cover of All I Want for Christmas is You. Nice, Jake said, swooping down behind Marco and joining him singing. Cassie remained perched on the ornament and rolled her eyes as she watched Marco and Jake descend for the staircase, still in the song's intro. Whatever, she said to herself, flying down to join them, just as they got to the main verse. Flying well over the elves' heads, three French hens landed on the banister of the staircase, already halfway down the first flight of stairs. The greenery and other decorations abruptly stopped below the first landing where the staircase turned to descend further. Cassie started around the corner, then said to Jake and Marco, You guys can't stop now, okay? We're trying to be inconspicuous here. Jake and Marco both abruptly stopped singing right before they got to the first big, you, you baby. <laughs> they took a quick look at each other, confirming what they both knew but would never admit. Mariah Carey was unquestionably both of their huge crushes. The three of them continued down the staircase until it gave way to a single, crudely formed set of stairs, carved out of the dirt and rock below. This is starting to remind me of a bad place, Cassie said, and Jake and Marco knew exactly where she met. Down a staircase from their middle school, they discovered a year clare underneath their entire town, where the year recharged their bodies and held their hosts hostage. I don't know what we're going to see down there, guys, Cassie continued, but we've got to stick together, and we've got to get out in time. Jake and Marco nodded. They both knew what she meant. After all, they still hadn't seen Tom and the rest of the sharing in the North Pole, but they'd seen them all in the year pool back home. They braced themselves and turned the last corner, entering into a cavernous underground space, illuminated only by light shining through light wells in the ceiling. And in front of them, a familiar sight, pools steaming as the warm water hit the cool air like a sauna. Hork Bajir, the peaceful aliens controlled by the Yerks, patrolled the area, forcing the elves toward the pools where a Yerk slug would drip out of the elves' heads and into the water. Off to one side, cages held elves, screaming, demanding their release. Among the elves, a few dozen others, pork bajir, humans, and Tom. At the opposite side, dozens of humans lounge in a separate sauna with drinks and snacks in hand. The Animorphs knew who these were, the Sharing's human members who had willingly given their brains to the Yerks for controlling, co-conspirators in their plan to dominate the universe. All of a sudden, three festive French hens felt very conspicuous in this very un-Christmas-like cavern. We've got to get cover, Marco said, catching a quick glimpse of Jake, who had his eyes locked on Tom. Over to the right, maybe we can work our way behind the cages and maybe get some intel. He started scooting that way. Come on, Jake. You doing all right? Cassie asked. We need to get out of sight. She gave Jake a slight shove to get him started and kept close behind him as they crept along the edge of the wall. French hens, while not the showiest of seasonal birds, still stuck out down there, where the only hint of the holidays was the clothes the imprisoned elves wore. No sign of Santa yet, Cassie whispered when they caught up to Marco.
They were crouched behind a pile of loose rocks and tools that looked as if they'd been left behind after digging out this chamber. The cages were still another 20 feet or so away, and the hork patrolled with some regularity. I've got to get him, Jake said, still focusing his gaze on Tom. I can get him. He doesn't have that yerk in his head right now. Cassie and Marco knew better than that. Jake, remember what we're here for right now. We still don't know what's going on completely and why the sharing's here to begin with. Cassie said to him, right now we're trying to find out what's going on with Santa. Then we can help Tom. Right now we just put him at more risk too. How's that snowboarding trip now, Marco said. Even though he was more engaged in the mission, he could still put his foot in his mouth. Sorry, Jake, I shouldn't joke about that now. It's just, before, it sounded like the snowboarding trip would have been pretty cool. I mean, a half pipe. The horde bajir making their patrol round suddenly moved to the front of the cages and stood at attention. The elves and humans in the cages were still protesting through their shouts, or though their shouts had died down to a murmur. Cassie, Marco, and then Jake all turned to follow the direction they faced. Across the pools, near the sharing sauna, was an arched opening carved from the same stones the rest of the cavern, but with additional refinements and the letters VC carved above the opening in a gothic font. The humans in the sauna stopped their chatter and stood up to face the opening as well. Before the Animorphs could see who was emerging, they could hear his unmistakable voice. Ho, ho, ho.